Well, good morning again. And um, this age management medical stuff really works because I just found out I'm older than those trees. I think I look pretty good for that. Um, I'm going to talk about medical myths and how we um, can bust them. And I've always been interested in what doctors say that we believe are true facts that we then pass on to our patients. So I decided to um, take on this topic for today's talk. This is me biting off more than I could chew. Um, I originally was going to talk about 10 medical myths. And when I got into uh, my research for that, I discovered that there is a lot of information. And it became more important to just focus on three and to point out a few more that you can research. Um, and most importantly, how to, to be more discerning uh, when learning information and passing it on to our patients so that we don't pass on medical myths. So we're myth busters. What's the definition of a myth? It's a tradi traditional or legendary story, usually concerning a hero or event, with or without basis of fact. Now, surely we don't do that in medicine, but I, I will um, propose that perhaps we do. So the objectives of my talk today is to discuss how medical myths influence doctors and their patients, and to discuss our role as physicians and health professionals to curtail medical myths, and to detail common, many times controversial, medical myths, and maybe most importantly, to discuss how medical myths become our beliefs. The three that I'm going to talk about today, one is um, what I like to do every morning, which is have a cup of coffee. And I find so many patients come in and they're so proud of themselves when they say to me, well, I only drink one cup of coffee a day. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and if they are indeed doing the right thing based on their doctor's orders. The next thing that I discovered when I uh, began my age, man age management medical practice was that when I started to have patients eat more fats and eggs in particular, that their cholesterol levels improved. So we're going to talk about the exact truth about saturated fat and cardiovascular disease. And the last myth is probably the myth that has had the most impact, I would say, on women's health in this country. And it's simple. HRT, hormone replacement, replacement therapy, causes breast cancer. I also want to get you thinking about, when you leave here today, some other myths that you may be propagating. Homocysteine and cardiovascular disease, prostate cancer and testosterone, interval training and heart disease, and statins for cardiovascular disease prevention in low-risk patients. I first want to talk about some sexual myths, just to get things started on the right track here this morning. Myth number one, men enjoy sex more than women. Now this is the new uh, form of CPR that's being uh, propagated by the American Heart Association. So myth number one, men enjoy sex more than women. Research has shown that if you're a man and you believe this, then the truth is that women maybe just don't enjoy sex with you. So, and you see my source at the bottom are 10,000 women. So how do myths become what we preach? Well, there are many ways. First, the media. Second would be the PDR, or the Physician's Desk Reference. Journals and abstracts, governmental agencies, pharmaceutical companies, article bias, inadequate investigation, skimming the abstracts, and inadequate due diligence by us, the physicians. Let's start with the first one, caffeine kills. I'm sure you know that coffee is one of the most widely consumed beverages in the United States and globally, and that coffee drinking is not generally considered a healthy lifestyle choice by most doctors because it contains caffeine. In fact, think about what kind of advice you give your patients. Coffee is bad for you. Coffee causes cancer. Coffee is bad for your cholesterol. Coffee is bad for your heart. Coffee is bad. Or 
coffee is good, depending on which literature and, and which day of the week it is. Well, let's talk about coffee and caffeine and what is really in there. So caffeine is a naturally occurring plant alkaloid. It's found in coffee, tea, cocoa. It's an additive in many drinks. It belongs to a group of purine-based compounds or methylxanthines. It also contains what are called phenolic and compounds and lignans. The phenolic compounds, if you look here, have some interesting qualities. They're antioxidant in activity. They can actually protect mammalian cells from genotoxins, and they may inhibit cell replication enzymes and prevent cancer growth through anti-estrogenic pathways or mitochondrial toxicity. The lignans help to, can, can be converted to enterolactone and enterodiol, and those are, are phytoestrogens. The lignans also have anti-estrogenic properties and can potentially reduce the risk of certain cancers. Doesn't sound too bad for us yet. Coffee contains more than 1,000 compounds that may affect the risk of death. It's rich in sources of antioxidants and bioactive compounds. It contains B3, magnesium, and potassium. And some studies have shown an inverse association between coffee consumption and serum biomarkers for inflammation and insulin resistance. Some of the studies came out many years ago that really gave coffee a bad name. And the question is, what were the limitations of those studies? Well, really, smoking cigarettes seem to be the strongest confounder in those studies. And studies in the past did not take into account the connections between drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. It also did not take into account that individuals metabolize caffeine differently. In fact, current research suggests that there's a genetic variability in how individuals metabolize coffee and may or may not affect sleep and the heart. These prior studies also did not consider the method of coffee preparation, which you'll see in a few minutes is very important. The method of, of preparation in several studies has been shown to be extremely important. Coffee that is boiled actually will cause a significant increase in LDL and a significant increase in homocysteine, whereas filtering the coffee reduces the cholesterol-raising substances. And in fact, espresso has that same positive effect. A study done with NIH and AARP in 2000, and published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2012 looked at a very large group in a prospective study, 229,000 participants. The results, when they looked at their caffeine intake, significant inverse associations of coffee consumption with death from all causes, specifically heart disease, respiratory disease, stroke, injuries, and diabetes. There was a modest inverse association between coffee drinking and total mortality in both sexes. This is looking at that same data, data, and what you really need to look at here is coffee as a risk, which is on one side of the graph, and coffee as being protective on the other side. And you can see that there are many more dots in the coffee being protected side um, compared to heart disease, cancer, stroke, injuries, diabetes, et cetera. What about if you drink too much coffee? Does that look like anybody out there? Two or more cups of coffee a day can increase the risk of heart disease in people with specific genetic mutation that slows the breakdown of coffee. Let's go on to another myth. Sex myth number two. You can judge the size of a man's package by the size of his feet. Well, meta-analysis of several studies shows that there's no relationship between the size of the man's feet and the size of his genital organs. So I want you to know that 10,000 women agree. What about heart disease and coffee? Well, an analysis in 2008, two different ones, one, um, a recent one done in 2012 and one in 2008. The one, more recent one, overall coffee consumption was not associated with significant increase in coronary artery disease. 
And that was especially when looking at the prospective studies. Another meta-analysis, meta 21 prospective cohort studies showed that drinking one to four cups of coffee per day was associated with a lower risk of coronary artery disease.